Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and in this video we're going to watch clips from Big Bang Theory Season 3 to see how accurate all the science and technology in the season really are. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes! You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Chocolate? No, I don't want to... Alright. I mean, using chocolate to reinforce positive behavior, morally there might be some concerns here, but the science is actually um, valid. This will work. Uh, it's like getting a sticker on your homework as a kid for doing really well it just encourage you to repeat that behavior, or a chocolate for an adult will correct any thing that's wrong and then reinforce that one. I don't recommend this because if someone figures out what you're doing, you're gonna have some serious trust issues going on. Although, if anyone's curious, it will work. First, consider an ordinary magnet, which has, as even the most uneducated in your audience must know, two poles. <clears throat> uh, north and south pole. If you cut that in half, you have two smaller magnets, each with its own north and south pole. Uh, yeah, the, the, the helium in the room. Uh, this is very, very real. And the next time you get a balloon or, or at like a birthday party, something like that, you can inhale the helium. I mean, not all of it, but just a little bit of it. And your voice will become much higher in pitch. And the reason for that is because our general voices right now is what it sounds like when we exhale carbon dioxide. But when you inhale helium and you start talking, what you're exhaling is mostly helium. So that's why your voice will actually change as that gas comes out of your mouth. That's also why when you blow up a balloon with just your breath, it will never float because you're exhaling carbon dioxide into it, which is a much heavier gas than all the atmosphere around you, which is nitrogen, oxygen, and probably some carbon dioxide up there. Helium, however, is a very, very light element. It will float to the top of anywhere you put it. We're going to combine these chemicals with ordinary dish soap, creating a little exothermic release of oxygen. <laughs> yeah, this is a very popular harmless scientific display. It's like the equivalent of vinegar and baking soda coming out of a clay volcano that a lot of us did in third grade, or at least we know what that looks like. This is called elephant toothpaste, and it's been done on multiple TV shows and talk shows. Exothermic means the chemical reaction releases heat, which we can see from the steam coming from the foam. The opposite is an endothermic reaction, which results in the chemical reaction being colder than its surroundings. An example of that is when we make ice cubes in the freezer. Liquid water becomes solid, and as a result, it's much colder. Let's plug in our 9.8 meters per second squared as A, and we get force, Earth gravity, equals mass times 9.8 meters per second per second. So we can see that MA equals MG, and what do we know from this? <laughs> what he's trying to get at is, that's, by the way, that is absolutely the correct number. Acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the reason I have that memorized is because I took a lot of physics classes over the years. And those equations on the board also are correct for calculating Earth's gravity. Gravity isn't the same on all planets or celestial bodies. The uh, moon has gravity, the sun has gravity, just like the Earth has gravity. But the reason they all vary in their strength is because of size. The larger the size, the stronger the, the gravitational pull. The moon is much smaller than the Earth, which is why the acceleration due to gravity is 1.62 meters per second squared. The sun, which is way bigger than the Earth, has a gravity of 274 meters per second squared. Given the parameters of your experiment, the transport of electrons through the aperture of the nanofabricated metal rings is qualitatively no different than the experiment already conducted in the Netherlands. <laughs> Alright, so... Yeah, I had to get a sip of coffee for that one, but... What Penny is talking about is a very, very fancy way of saying how electrons are transported down a metal tube and the interference at the quantum level can be observed. There's constructive and destructive quantum interference. If you look at the blue part of this graph, when everything is in sync, it's a smooth line. And when they're opposing, like in the red graph, you get sharp destructive interference. You can also observe this in everyday life. 
This image shows the colored interference pattern of soap, something we all, hopefully, I pray to God, that we use every day. The black holes are total destructive interference, meaning all the light cancels out and it's void of light, which is why you have this color. These are not set in stone. As the soap content is moving back and forth, these destructive interferences will, just like that graph, shift back and forth. It's not at all consistent, but it is measurable. I've been meaning to thank you for your notes on my paper disproving quantum brain dynamic theory. My pleasure. For a non-physicist, you have a remarkable grasp of how electric dipoles in the brain's water molecules could not possibly form a Bose condensate. Well, that's... okay. Th that seems kind of pointless. Why would you even need to write a paper on that? The uh, Boson-Einstein condensates form when subatomic particles approach zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero. And... You, like, so at that um, temperature, molecules cannot vibrate. There's no kinetic energy transfer, and you will die <laughs> well before you get to zero kelvins. So I, I don't understand. They said in the human brain, like, what's the point in seeing if certain molecules in your brain survive after you're dead and it's beneath frozen? Hey, here come the jokes. <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the Mobius Strip? to get to the same side. Bazinga! I don't even want to laugh at that, but a Mobius strip, I think a lot of people have heard that from Avengers Endgame when um, Tony Stark said an inverted Mobius strip will solve time travel. But uh, what that shape is, is just a one-sided spiral, basically. You see them in a lot of different things. You can make it right now with a piece of paper, just cut like a little strip of it, and then before you put them over each other, just twist one end. Then you'll all, once you follow it, it's gonna be the same side the entire time. Hey, Leonard, where do you come down on giant ants? <laughs> Sheldon says impossible. How, and I say not only possible, but as a mode of transportation, way cooler than a Batmobile. <laughs> You're ignoring the square cube law. The giant ant would be crushed under the weight of its own exoskeleton. That is very much so correct. The square cube law states that as a shape grows in size, its volume increases faster than its surface area. I cover the square cube law much more in depth in my Pacific Rim video with a lot more examples from the movie, but just know that as things get really, really big, they get unproportionally heavier. So it's... Like what Sheldon's saying was like the, the the whole body of the ant would collapse under his exoskeleton. That's absolutely correct because you can't just get super massive and maintain the same density. It's actually going to be really, really heavy and likely not able to sustain itself. Or it's just going to look like some really weird dog. That's a messed up looking dog.